Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we are here to talk about Matthew and Year A. Uh, so just to lay down the basics, as we probably all know but could use a reminder, the Second Vatican Council gave us a great gift by rearranging the lectionary for Mass. And one of the beautiful things that they did was put us on a three-year lectionary cycle, uh, three years designated by A, B, and C, uh, in which we read the three what we call synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three first gospels are called synoptic because they view the life of Jesus in a similar way. Soon in Hebrew means, uh, excuse me, in Greek means with, and optic means to see. So soon optic or synoptic means to look with or to see with a common perspective. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the same basic story of Jesus with a lot of variation, but then John marches to the beat of his own drummer and tells the story of our Lord's life in a very different way. Uh, in John, for example, the career of our Lord is recounted over three years, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke just give us a single year of our Lord's public ministry. Well, in any event, uh, Vatican II gave us this wonderful gift, the lectionary. And so on a three-year cycle, we, we read Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. And year A, the first of the three years, is devoted to Matthew. So as we uh, begin year A once more um, and have worked through this previous cycle, now come back to the beginning, and it's time to get to know the gospel author Matthew once again. And so in this uh, little study of Matthew that we're going to do together, we're going to break it up into three parts uh, around the rubric of Matthew the man, Matthew the book, and Matthew the year. So let's get started. Just make some initial observations about Matthew's gospel, which is, of course, the reason why he is so famous. So, Matthew's gospel is the first gospel in so many ways. It's first in order, but it also has a sort of theological primacy. It is the best organized and the most balanced of the gospels. Uh, it gives a, a very even distribution and representation of our Lord's teaching. And so, it's always been kind of the foundational gospel uh, on which uh, the other Gospels build, and indeed the other parts of the New Testament build. It's the most systematic and comprehensive of the Gospels. There's nothing important about Jesus' teaching or ministry that is missing from Matthew, uh, whereas there are missing parts of other uh, Gospels. For example, Mark um, never gives us an account of what happens after the first moments of Jesus' resurrection, nor does Mark give us a uh, birth account, a na nativity story of our Lord. And uh, John's Gospel also lacks that feature, as well as other important events. For example, uh, John's Gospel does not tell us about the institution of the Eucharist. So, a Gospel like John is really building on a Gospel like Matthew. I would argue, for example, that the evangelist John believes that you have read the other three Gospels before you get to his, and he just presumes that you know some basic events, whereas Matthew makes no presumptions. Matthew works very well as the first and only Gospel that maybe you encounter. It will give you a complete description of Jesus' teaching and ministry. Matthew's Gospel is also the most explicitly Jewish of the Gospels, and in it we find the most explicit quotations of the Old Testament. So there are 50 explicit uh, quotations of the Old Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. That, those are quotations that say something like, as was written in the prophets, and then gives a quote. In addition to those quotes, we also have um, about 150 allusions or evocations or other kinds of references 
to, or echoes of the Old Testament for a total of about 200 references of any kind to the Old Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. So very heavily interacting with the scriptures of Israel. And for that reason, St. Matthew's Gospel makes a wonderful bridge from the Old Testament to the New. And you can see that's how it was positioned in the Bible by the church as the first book of the New Testament, making this transition from the Old to the New. Now, uh, sometimes I like to tell my students that Matthew is like the Abe Lincoln of New Testament authors. Okay, nobody ever has anything bad to say about Abraham Lincoln, and everybody respects him. And that is the case with St. Matthew when you look at his history uh, of the use of his gospel in the early church. It is always a situation of respect and reverence uh, for Matthew and for his gospel. So Matthew's gospel is one of the first gospels to show a strong influence on early Christian writing. We, when we look at, for example, some of the earliest of the church fathers, like Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote about the year 106, or another very early Christian writing called the Didache, uh, or the, um, which is a compilation of uh, teachings from uh, the Twelve Apostles. These very early writings are already clearly alluding to and influenced by the Gospel of Matthew. Many of the church fathers wrote commentaries on Matthew, for example, um, Origen, uh, who lived uh, in the middle of the 200s, great, great early scholar of the church. He wrote a 25-volume commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. So the early fathers were willing to spill a lot of ink on this apostle and the record of our Lord's um, ministry that he left us. So Matthew has been a perennial staple of the church's cycles of reading, the ancient lectionaries of the church, and of course the modern lectionary of the church, draw on Matthew extensively. So let's talk about who Matthew was. The New Testament just gives us a few but very important indications of his life and personhood. First of all, he has a double name. He's also known as Levi, and the Gospels record him as a tax collector. A very important passage would be Matthew 9, 9 and following, which is Matthew's own account of his call. We read, as Jesus passed on from there, in Matthew 9, 9, he saw a man called Matthew. Now, in Mark's account, Mark records his name as Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Okay, so that's important to remember. Okay, Mark and Luke record him as Levi. Mark mentions that he's the son of Alphaeus. So, Jesus sees this man called Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he says to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Okay, so that's Matthew 9, 9, and 10. That's paralyzed, uh, paralleled, excuse me, in Mark uh, 2, 14, and in Luke 5, 27. So this tells us that uh, Matthew was an educated man. If he was a tax collector, that's essentially the equivalent of an ancient accountant slash IRS agent. So he must have had training in writing and in record keeping. That suggests that he was trained as a scribe because scribes were kind of um, uh, generalists uh, in terms of record keepers in the ancient world. Uh, wasn't a distinction between, say, a financial record keeper versus someone who could copy out literature. They were all just scribes. So we can say that Matthew probably had scribal training. Um, and uh, as we'll mention later, we can tell from his gospel that he had a background with the Pharisee movement. He's very engaged with Pharisee thought and Pharisaic argumentation. So we can imagine he was probably raised uh, in the Pharisee movement and then uh, went astray, became a black sheep because being a tax collector in Jewish culture was something that was very unapproved, okay, it would be kind of like being a drug dealer for us. If we had a child who left the Catholic faith and became a drug dealer, not something that we'd be proud of. 
Likewise, for Jewish parents to raise their uh, son in a strict Jewish environment and have, then have him go be a tax collector and work for the hated Romans, collecting the despised taxes, that would not have been something that they were proud of. And so Matthew Levi was a kind of social outcast because of this role. Now Luke goes on to tell us about the feast that Matthew sponsored or gave at his house after having been called as a disciple by Jesus. And so we read in Luke 5, 29, Levi, that's what Luke calls him, made Jesus a great feast in his house, and the Pharisees murmured, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So that very famous statement of our Lord, not come to call the righteous, but sinners, that actually was delivered by our Lord in the context of Matthew's calling and then the party that Matthew threw immediately afterwards. So Matthew was a humble man. He recognized that his background was in sin, that he was a collaborator with the Roman oppressors against uh, God's people, uh, the people of Judea. And yet he was called by Jesus to spread the gospel. So very much like Paul, who calls himself the greatest of sinners, Matthew here portrays himself as being called out of a lifestyle of sin to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, what else does the New Testament tell us concerning Matthew? He's not mentioned very often, but another occurrence of his name is in the list of the twelve that our Lord called. In Matthew's own account, in Matthew 10, 2, uh, we read the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. That's the complete list of the twelve. And we can see that Matthew isn't even particularly high in the list. He's seventh or eighth uh, in all of the Gospels that record the list of the twelve, kind of down there. Um, always close to Thomas and James, interestingly. You'll notice that James is designated here the son of Alphaeus. And uh, in Mark um, chapter 2, we read about Levi being the son of Alphaeus as well. And so that suggests that Matthew, Levi, and James were brothers. Of course, this James is the James we typically know as James the Less, who later became Bishop of Jerusalem and a very important leader in the early church. He made some important contributions to that council in Jerusalem that we read about in Acts 15. All right, so Matthew is one of the twelve included in all the lists of the twelve. And he's also mentioned in Acts 1, verses 12 and following, where the apostles are again named in the context of gathering together in the upper room just before the Holy Spirit is poured out. They gather around the Blessed Mother in preparation for Pentecost, and Matthew is there. And Acts chapter 1 is the last time that Matthew is mentioned in Scripture. Um, the church fathers do talk about him, though. For example, one of the very early fathers, Papias, uh, who lived between the years 60 and 140, uh, gave some recollections late in his life that are recorded by St. Eusebius, who wrote the first history of the uh, early church. And Papias is recorded as saying, If then anyone who had attended the elders came, I asked minutely after their sayings, this is Papias speaking now, what Andrew or Peter said or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or by James or by John or by Matthew or by any other of the Lord's disciples, uh, which things uh, Aristion and the elder John, the disciple of the Lord, say. For I imagined that what was to be got from books was not so profitable to me as what came from the living and abiding voice. Papias also says that Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language and each one interpreted them 
as best he could. This is probably a reference to an early form of the Gospel of Matthew. St. Irenaeus, writing um, a bit later, maybe a generation later than Papias, uh, in his famous work Against Heresies, which was composed around the year 180, speaks of Matthew and says, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews, that means the Jews, in their own dialect, their own language, while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome and laying the foundations of the church. That would place Matthew's gospel around the year 60. St. Jerome says quite a bit about um, Matthew. In describing the Gospels, he says, first of all the Gospels is Matthew, the tax collector, who was also named Levi, who published a Gospel in Judea in the Hebrew language, chiefly for the sake of those from the Jews who had believed in Jesus and who were by no means observing the shadow of the law since the truth of the Gospel had succeeded it. So here's Jerome saying, Matthew writes his gospel to the Jews who had already converted to Christianity. And again, in another place, Jerome says, Matthew, also called Levi, apostle and aforetimes a publican, that's a tax collector, composed a gospel of Christ at first published in Judea and Hebrew for the sake of those of the circumcision who believed, that's the Jews, but this was afterwards translated into Greek, though by whom is uncertain. The Hebrew itself has been preserved until the present day. I've also had the opportunity of having the volume, this Hebrew volume of Matthew, described to me by the Nazarenes of Berea. Um, And in quoting from the Old Testament, Matthew does not follow the authority of the translators of the Septuagint, but the Hebrew. Wherefore, these two forms exist. Out of Egypt I have called my son, and he shall be called a Nazarene. There, Jerome quotes two um, statements of the prophets that occur in the early chapters of Matthew that do not follow the the Septuagint translation, that's the ancient Greek translation, but follow the Hebrew. We'll talk about that more uh, later in our study together uh, when we look at uh, Matthew's style in quoting from the Old Testament. So, let's sum up here. What do we know about Matthew the man? Well, He was a tax collector. He was probably trained as a Jewish scribe before becoming a tax collector. Uh, His original uh, given name was Levi. Later he came to be called Matthew. Many believe that Matthew, which means gift of God, was a nickname given to him by Jesus, just like Jesus often nicknames other apostles as well, calling Simon, for example. Cephas or Rocky, right? Uh, We know that Matthew was called a son of Alphaeus, as was James the Less, and so Matthew was probably a brother of James the Less, also an apostle. And we find out from elsewhere in Scripture that James the Less was a brother of the Lord. That means a male relative, probably a cousin of the Lord. Ancient Christian tradition identifies Alphaeus, the father of James and Matthew, as the same as uh, a figure named Cleophas, who was a brother of St. Joseph. So that would make James and Matthew cousins of our Lord legally through their father, Alphaeus, also known as Cleophas, who was a brother of St. Joseph. So very interesting, isn't that? And we find strong similarities between the Gospel of Matthew and the Epistle of James. A lot of work has been done by scholars on that. After the little bit of Matthew that's recorded for us in the book of Acts, the patristic tradition places his career and his apostolic ministry in the Caucasus, that's uh, modern-day Armenia and Georgia, and also in northern Persia, which is modern-day Iran, and somewhere in there he was martyred, although we're not sure how. So, aside from his gospel, Matthew lived most of his ministry in quietness, as most of us are called to do as well. Uh, We're not going to receive great accolades of the things that we do for the Lord during our lifetime, at least most of us won't. Neither did St. Matthew, 
and yet by our fidelity, we, like him, will serve to build up the kingdom of God. And now let's look at this gospel that he left us and admire its uniqueness and its structure. In order to get into Matthew's Gospel, I'd like to invite you to do a little sketching exercise with me. Probably many of you know that I love to do stick figures, and when it comes to the Gospel of Matthew, this is no exception. So we're actually going to sketch out together the overview or the flow of the Gospel of Matthew. If you have a piece of paper uh, available, you can pull that out and orient it to uh, landscape that is... Uh, uh, horizontally, and we're going to begin by sketching the beginning and the end of Matthew, and then we'll fill out the middle. So, what is the beginning of Matthew? Why, it's Christmas. It is what we call the infancy narratives, the stories of Christ's childhood, uh, told especially through the eyes of St. Joseph, Whereas, say, St. Luke tells the stories of our Lord's birth through the eyes of the Blessed Mother. If uh, we have been correct in our conjectures, and uh, St. Matthew is a relative of our Lord through Cleophas, the brother of St. Joseph, we can understand why the kind of Josephite view of these events would have come down to St. Matthew. So, Matthew chapters 1 and 2, that's Matthew's Christmas, and corresponding to that at the end of the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew's Easter, which is Matthew 26 through 28, the three chapters that describe basically the Holy Triduum culminating in the resurrection of our Lord. So, Christmas and Easter, these are the brackets of Matthew just as they are the brackets of the main portion of the liturgical calendar. Now, filling in the middle, we need to do something first. There is a shadowy figure who is in the background of Matthew's Gospel all the time. Uh, we're going to sketch him in here. Uh, if you've read some of my other books, you may begin to recognize who this is. Uh, we're going to put in his arms uh, five tablets, and that probably gives it away already, uh, the identity of this character. And we're going to make his face shine with uh, the presence of God as uh, his books record as he went up on Mount Sinai, and this of course is Moses. Moses is the background figure all the time in the Gospel of Matthew. And one of the themes of Matthew's Gospel is to present Jesus Christ as a new Moses. What do we mean by that? As the definitive prophet of God. Uh, the prophet of God who cannot be gainsaid and who stands above all the rest. That's what Moses meant for the Jews. But Jesus replaces Moses as the great prophet of God. Now, that's not all that our Lord is. That's not all that Matthew presents him as. As we uh, begin to read through the gospel, we uh, eventually come to understand um, indirectly at first and more explicitly as we move on that Jesus is more than a prophet. He is God incarnate. But Matthew brings his Jewish readers to that conclusion gently and indirectly because he knows that it is going to be a hard point for them to swallow. So he doesn't present Jesus in his full divinity immediately, but allows his Jewish readers to gradually come to realize that God has come down and made his dwelling among us in human form, and that is Jesus Christ. So we're sketching in Moses in the background. Um, Jesus is a new Moses in the Gospel of Matthew. and the body of Matthew's Gospel is, like the books of Moses, divided into five major sections. So, we're going to sketch these out once more. We're going to, uh, if our Lord will forgive us, uh, give a little sketch of Jesus here. Um, 
and we're going to give him one hand uh, teaching, making an important point, and in his other hand, we're get, going to give him a scroll, which represents a sermon. There are five major sermons of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, we're going to put on our Lord's head a crown and a halo. The crown is for royalty because Matthew consistently presents Jesus as the royal son of David, the king of Israel come to claim his people. And he also presents our Lord as divine, and that's what the halo represents there. So royal and divine uh, teaching us, and uh, his first sermon there in his right hand, and we're going to put him on a mountain because the first and last sermons of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of Matthew both take place on mountaintops. Of course, mountains are very significant in salvation history. Typically, they're places of covenant making, as we know, and so it's appropriate here. The new covenant is also being made on a mountaintop. Well, the first of our Lord's sermons, and also the longest in the Gospel of Matthew, is what we might call the Mount of Beatitudes Sermon, or more widely known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Matthew 3 through 7. Matthew chapters 3 and 4 are most, mostly the, uh, the actions and the healings and the activity of Jesus. And then we, when we hit chapter 5, 5 through 7 is his teaching. That famous Sermon on the Mount uh, is the world's greatest sermon, without a doubt, and it is all themed to the kingdom of God. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes are characteristics of kingdom citizens. The middle of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is the prayer for the coming of the kingdom, right? Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray. So the Lord's Prayer is a kingdom prayer in the middle of the sermon. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we have a kingdom parable about a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And Jesus says, if you listen to this sermon and put it into practice, you will be like that wise man. Well, who is that wise man who built his house upon the rock? That is a not-so-subtle allusion to Solomon, the greatest king of Israel's history, who built the greatest house in Israel's history on the largest rock outcropping in the nation's geography, which is a huge stone called the Stone of Foundation in Jerusalem, an outcropping of bedrock where Solomon built the temple. So there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you listen to my teachings and put them into practice, you will be like the greatest king that Israel ever knew. So, qualities of kingdom citizens, the kingdom prayer in the middle, and an allusion to the greatest king at the end. From beginning to end, the Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom of God. And as we learn uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, that kingdom is manifested all ready on earth, it is in fact the church. The church is the earthly manifestation, the earthly appearance of God's kingdom here in time and space. So that's the first section of the Gospel of Matthew. We're not going to redraw our Lord every time for these next uh, four sections, but we'll just do two scrolls representing the second um, sermon of our Lord. And that is the mission sermon, which concludes the second section of Matthew, Matthew 8 through 10. Chapters 8 and 9 are about the words and deeds of our Lord as he's ministering in Galilee. And chapter 10 is a sermon on mission work when Jesus sends out the 12 uh, to bring the gospel to the people of Israel. The third section of Matthew's gospel, we'll draw three scrolls here is concluded by the mystery sermon in Matthew chapter 13. This section 11 through 13 consists of, again, accounts of our Lord's deeds and healings and some scattered teachings in chapters 11 and 12. 
concludes with a sermon of our Lord about the mystery of the kingdom. That's Matthew 13. In that chapter, there are seven parables about the kingdom, very famous parables like uh, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field, um, the net that's cast out and brings in both good and bad fish. All of those are parables about uh, the kingdom, our Lord says. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like that. You can tell from those parables that he's speaking about the church and not just about heaven. Take, for example, the kingdom of, excuse me, the parable of the net. Jesus says the kingdom is like a net thrown into the sea that brings out fish of many kinds, both good and bad. Um, that represents the church. The church is a net, an evangelistic net that draws into itself through its evangelistic mission, um, both the righteous as well as the rascals, as it were. And they both dwell within the visible church. And we can think of examples of this. There are notorious sinners who identify as Catholics, as well as wonderful saints who give us a, a great example of holiness who also take upon themselves the name and the mantle of the Catholic Church. And so we know that the visible church in this uh, earthly reality is a mixed bag, so to speak, or to use uh, the analogy of our Lord, a mixed net. Um, but it's not going to be like that in the church triumphant. It's not going to be like that in the life to come after the final judgment. And so we know that these parables about the kingdom in Matthew 13 are talking about the kingdom as it is present here and now on this earth in historical time, that is to say, as manifested in the church. And those parables are very important for us as Catholics, and perhaps we'll have an opportunity in a few minutes to come back to that and discuss that at greater length. But the fourth section of Matthew's Gospel, we'll draw four scrolls for this fourth sermon that concludes this fourth section, is uh, the mercy section, concluding with the mercy sermon in Matthew 18. Again, chapters 14 through 17 are talking about the Lord's deeds and his actions as he continues to minister in Galilee and begins to move now towards the south, towards Judea, where he's going to end his ministry. And this section of Matthew is concluded in chapter 18 with our Lord's only sermon on the theme of mercy. This is the famous sermon where he tells Peter not to forgive seven times, but 77 times. This is the famous sermon where he tells the parable of the unforgiving servant who is forgiven millions of dollars worth of debt by his master, but then turns around and chokes that other fellow servant who just owes him about like a hundred bucks. And um, so we have those beautiful instructions on how to express mercy and forgiveness within the body of the church. This is also the sermon where we have that instruction on fraternal correction, where if you have a problem with a fellow brother or sister in the church, you don't go and gossip about it, but you go to them directly. And if they don't listen to you, you bring a friend along and the two of you go to him and so on. And eventually, if he does not repent, you tell it to the church, but you don't gossip. And that's, of course, what we call fraternal correction, an important spiritual practice in the Catholic spiritual tradition. So the fifth section of Matthew's Gospel is also on a mountain, as the first section was. And we're going to sketch our Lord once more, and we're going to uh, fill his arms uh, with scrolls here, because we've come to the climax. He's now delivered five sermons to us, Jesus, the new Moses, uh, our new teacher. And this final sermon is delivered on the Mount of Olives. And this sermon is particularly in Matthew 23 through 25. Some call it our Lord's eschatological discourse. Eschatological is a big term that just means the end times. So it's our Lord's discourse that talks about the last things. Um, it's also been called the Armageddon sermon because it talks about the final battle and the final judgment, uh, etc. So our Lord delivers this on the Mount of Olives. Here is where uh, our Lord tells us the famous parable of the sheep and the goats being judged at the final judgment. 
This is a text to which the church, the church turns typically on the last Sunday of the liturgical year, the Feast of Christ the King, as a solemn warning to all of us about what we are going to have to face when we look at our Lord at the final judgment, where we will be judged on, among other things, our works of mercy and whether we offered that cup of cold water to the poor brother. So, at this point, we have a kind of a complete representation of our Lord's teaching. The Mount of Beatitudes Sermon, or the Sermon on the Mount, being a description of life in the kingdom, and then individual sermons on mission work, on the mystery of the kingdom, uh, the mercy that should characterize our life as kingdom citizens, and then about the end times on the Mount of Olives. So that's the overview of Matthew's Gospel. We're very thankful for him giving us this picture, because within this gospel, there is so much unique material that we find nowhere else. And I'd just like to spend a few minutes with you as we conclude talking about that unique Matthean material. Let's talk first of all about unique narratives in Matthew, historical accounts that we get nowhere else. The genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 is entirely unique. You might think that, oh, there's a genealogy in Luke 3, but a different genealogy. The probable explanation for this is the genealogy in Matthew 1 is Joseph's genealogy, and in Luke 3, it's the Blessed Mother's. We also get the account of the birth of Jesus through Joseph's eyes in the remainder of Matthew 1. The visit of the Magi and the flight to Egypt are completely unique to Matthew's Gospel, and so uh, the solemnity of Epiphany uh, we would not even have were it not for this biography of Jesus from this apostle. There are many narratives about Peter that are unique to Matthew. The walking on the water, the gift of the keys of the kingdom to Peter, Peter and the temple tax where he finds that coin in the mouth of the fish, and Peter's discussion with our Lord about how many times he should forgive, the uh, seven times, the 77 times, etc., that too is unique to Matthew's Gospel. And so we see that Matthew has a particular interest in St. Peter. This very well may indicate that St. Peter was still alive when this Gospel was published. The death of Judas in Matthew 27, 3 through 10, is unique to Matthew's Gospel. Pilate washing his hands, the resurrection of the saints in the vicinity of Jerusalem upon the resurrection of our Lord, and the account of the guard at the tomb set by the Sadducees and the chief priests, all those little details of the final days of our Lord's life are unique to Matthew as well. Let's talk next about some unique teachings in Matthew. So our Lord emphasizing that he came not to um, abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them, is again unique to Matthew, and we've talked about this before, how Matthew is the most uh, Jewish of the Gospels and serves as a bridge from Old to New Testament, and he wants to reassure his Jewish readers that Jesus comes in continuity with the prophets who spoke to them before. The six, what we call the six antitheses, or the six contradictions in Matthew 5, the six times in the Sermon on the Mount where Uh, Our Lord says, you have heard that it was written, or you have heard that it was said, and then he'll quote from the Mosaic Law, and then he will correct that. That is unique to Matthew. That, by the way, shows that our Lord is divine, because in the Jewish worldview, there was no one above Moses but God himself. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus corrects Moses. And if Jesus is correcting Moses, That can only mean that Jesus is above Moses, and as I said before, the only one above Moses is God. And so it's a quiet claim to divinity what Jesus is doing there in Matthew 5. Those instructions about almsgiving, fasting, and prayer that we receive in Matthew chapter 6 that we typically read on Ash Wednesday, again, unique to Matthew. Matthew. 
the statement about not casting pearls before swine, unique to Matthew as well. Um, the limitation of the ministry of the Twelve to the house of Israel is a little touch that only Matthew throws in. The famous uh, statement of our Lord, Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, we only find in Matthew, as well as the instructions about fraternal correction, going to your brother who sinned against you and then taking along another, and we're familiar with that whole scenario, but were it not for Matthew, we would not have that at all. Also, the prohibition of titles, call no man father on earth, call no man teacher, because you have one father, one teacher in heaven. Only Matthew tells us that. Matthew has a long section of denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees in chapter 23 that only he includes. And we would not have the Great Commission were it not for this gospel author. So look at how indebted we are to him. Go, therefore, into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Finally, let's conclude by looking at some unique parables in Matthew. The weeds and the wheat, the treasure hidden in a field, the pearl of great price, the net that we spoke about before. All of those are found in Matthew 13. All four of those parables of the kingdom are only included in Matthew. The unforgiving servant in the mercy sermon of chapter 18, as well as the parable of the laborers in the vineyard in chapter 20, are unique to this gospel. Matthew also tells us about that small parable about the two sons, the one who claims that he's going to do the father's will but doesn't, the other who denies the father but then goes and does what he says. That parable of the two sons we only have in Matthew. The wise and the foolish virgins. Wow, so powerful. The five wise, the five foolish, the five wise who have oil in their lamps and so are able to welcome the bridegroom when he comes. That speaks to us powerfully uh, of, of um, perseverance in the Christian life until the second coming of Christ. Only this apostle tells us this and the following parable, the sheep and the goats, the final judgment which, as I've mentioned before, we use at the end of the liturgical year. Thank you, Matthew, for including Jesus' teaching, for recording that for posterity. We are so grateful to you. The lectionary, of course, tries to emphasize Matthew's peculiarities. And what does Matthew like to especially talk about? Well, he likes to focus on Peter and he likes to focus on royal themes. He very much sees Jesus as the royal son of David, come back to reestablish the kingdom of David. But recall that the kingdom of David was not only over Israel, but it was also over all the Gentiles. So as we wrap up our study of the Gospel of Matthew and Year A, I'd like to focus on three or four key texts that we're going to read during this year that show this focus of Matthew on Jesus as the King of Israel, but not just over Israel, over all the nations as well. And of course, that rule over all the nations is manifest even now in historical time in the Holy Roman Catholic church. Well, let's look, for example, at how Matthew opens with the genealogy of Jesus. We get this every year on Christmas Eve. We read about how Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac of Jacob, Jacob of Judah, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and we go on all the way down to David and Solomon, and then all the way down to Saint Joseph, going from father to son. In this process, there are four women who are unusually mentioned in this genealogy. Tamar, who is the mother of Perez and Zerah, the descendants of Judah. Tamar, if you recall, was a Canaanitess. She was not a Jew, not an Israelite. She was a Gentile. 
And she was the daughter-in-law of Judah, and she conceived by Judah by pretending to be a harlot. Not very, you know, memorable if we're trying to think of women that we want to recall and bring to mind in the genealogy of the Messiah. Uh, And the next woman mentioned as well is Rahab, who was a Jerichoite, okay, also a Gentile, and she ran a brothel in Jericho where the spies hid when um, Joshua was scouting out the land, and later she married in to the line of Judah. And then we have Ruth, who is the wife of Boaz and the mother of Obed and one of the ancestresses of David. Ruth was herself a Moabitess, a non-Israelite, and uh, she had that sketchy scene, you might recall, in Ruth 3, where she made a very provocative play to reel in Boaz in the middle of the night when she's all dressed up and snuggling up to him on a threshing floor. We won't go any farther with that, but that's a, you know, that scene got the PG-13 rating for that rom-com. But anyway, we move on, and the last woman mentioned is not even named. She's just uh, described as the wife of Uriah when it says that David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And that calls to mind, of course, Bathsheba, who was involved in David's uh, adultery. And so the question is, why mention these four women? Why does Matthew mention them in the genealogy of the Lord? Why not? you know, the usual suspects who would be like Rachel and Rebecca and Sarah. Well, let's think. What was Jesus accused of? Well, he was accused of hanging around with prostitutes and tax collectors. And what was the problem with tax collectors? Well, they were associated with the Gentiles. And so Jesus shows us that the Messiah, who was criticized by his enemies for hanging around with tax collectors, and prostitutes actually had prostitutes and Gentiles in his ancestry. You see, this Messiah, this king, is going to be a king not just for the righteous of Israel, but for the sinners of Israel and for the sinners of all the nations. And so in this genealogy, we certainly see that Jesus is Jewish royalty, Okay, he has the line of the kings from David all the way to St. Joseph. And yet, already in his ancestry, we see that God was hinting at a universal mission, a mission of this royal son to go out to the Gentiles and to sinners. And that's precisely what our Lord does in the rest of this gospel. It makes us think of the Great Commission which comes at the end of Matthew, but it's not read at the end of the liturgical year. It's actually read on Ascension Day, which is going to come and uh, you know, be celebrated by us uh, near the end of the Easter season, 10 days before Pentecost. And in year A, we're going to read the Great Commission from Matthew, Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says. That means that the promise of Psalm 2, which was the royal coronation hymn of the King of Israel, is fulfilled in Jesus. Psalm 2 says to the son of David, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells the the disciples, in effect, this promise of Psalm 2 has been fulfilled, and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I've asked of it. I've asked for it. The Father has given it to me. Now, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He's commissioning them as his princes of his royal kingdom to go out and spread his kingdom to all the nations because the nations belong to him. And he goes on to say, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Notice that he does not simply say, teach them all that I have commanded, but teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is our Lord's Jewishness and Matthew's Jewishness um, shining forth 
in Judaism, it's not simply to know the law, but you have to practice the law. And Jesus is the new Moses come to give us the new law, the, new, the law of life, which is in fact the gospel. But the disciples have to be taught to observe. You are not truly a disciple in Judaism until you actually practice what you know. And that's emphasized in Matthew's account of the Great Commission. Jesus is Jewish royalty, and yet his mission is universal. This is a theme that runs throughout Matthew's gospel. Let's look at two more texts. First of all, Matthew 16, a very royal text. We're going to read this late in the liturgical, in the liturgical year and on the 21st Sunday, which is going to fall as the last Sunday of August in 2023. Then at that time, we're going to read what our Lord says to Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, that means son of John in the Aramaic language, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you. We're talking about Peter's confession of Christ, which came in the previous verses. But my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, which means rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, royal imagery there in Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom were entrusted in the kingdom of David, to the royal steward. We see this in Isaiah 22, verse 22. There we see reflected the fact that the royal steward, who was the number two in charge in the kingdom, had the keys to the royal throne room, and he could control who came in and who was excluded from the presence of the king, and that gave him great power. And these keys of the kingdom of heaven which is also the kingdom of David, because Jesus is both son of God and son of David, are now being entrusted to Peter, who's being established as the royal steward of Jesus' kingdom, which is manifested on earth in the church. And that's why the successor of Peter has always ruled over the church. We call him the Pope. And his symbol and on his flag are the keys, because the keys are the sign of of the royal steward. It's been that way since David established his kingdom in 1000 BC. And you see this continuity between the kingdom of David and the Catholic Church. Our Lord goes on to say to Peter in Matthew 16, 19, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing were Jewish terms to refer to the authority to interpret God's law in a, in a binding way, okay, in, in an authoritative way for God's people. Um, scholars of the time of our Lord, like Josephus, the Jewish historian, record that the Pharisees tried to bind and loose for the people of Israel. That is to say, they tried to interpret God's law for the people and explain to them what they should do and not do. But this power of interpretation really did not belong to the Pharisees, it belonged to the priests. And now Jesus is giving it to Peter and to the apostles in communion with him. They are going to be the new priests of the new Israel that Jesus is establishing, the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of David, manifested in the church. And so Peter and the apostles with him are going to interpret God's law authoritatively for the people of God. We see this manifested in papal teaching throughout church history. In times when the people of God don't know exactly what to do in a new circumstance, how do we interpret God's law in this new circumstance? The Pope answers and explains having this power given to him by Jesus to the first Pope, uh, who was Peter, the royal steward over the kingdom. And then finally, let's look at the last gospel of the liturgical year, which we read on the feast of Christ the King. 
When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. This, of course, is from the end of Matthew 25. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Of course, this idea of king as shepherd is very uh, closely tied to the kingdom of David. What was David, after all, before he was anointed king? He was a shepherd boy. So he was always the shepherd king. And that idea of David, the shepherd king, comes back here in our Lord's parable about the final judgment when he, the Son of Man, is going to sit and be the definitive Davidic king and judge over all the nations at the last judgment. So the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And he goes on to tell the parable, and we're very uh, familiar with that, being judged for our works of mercy toward the most vulnerable among us. But observe how even at this last gospel of the liturgical year, when our Lord is looking forward to the final events of human history, we still have that Jewish royal theme, Jesus as the royal son of David, king over Israel, but also that universality. All the nations have been incorporated into David's kingdom, and now the Son of David rules over them and judges them. That is the message of the Gospel of Matthew. What the prophets of Israel predicted has come about. A son of David has arisen in our midst, who is fit to rule not only over the kingdom of Israel, but over all the nations, And now in the Catholic Church, representatives from all the nations have been gathered in and have accepted the kingship of the royal son of David, king over Israel. That is us, the disciples of the Lord. We are his subjects in the kingdom, and we look forward to sharing his reign for all eternity. The images of the four evangelists go back to the visions of the prophet Ezekiel, particularly in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, where Ezekiel sees these cherubim, these warrior guardian angels that have four faces, uh, an eagle, a bull, a lion, and a man. These are royal animals in each case. Um, If you think about it, the eagle is the king of all flying creatures. The bull was the king of all domestic animals. The lion was regarded as the king of all wild animals. And humanity is king over all. That's the message of Genesis chapter 1, of course. So these cherubim are portrayed before the prophet uh, Ezekiel as having all the qualities of mastery over all creation. Now, in the patristic era, as the fathers meditated on those passages from the prophet Ezekiel, they saw that fourfold imagery as being fulfilled in one sense, not the only sense to be sure, but one manifestation of the fulfillment of the spiritual meaning of the four faces of the cherubim was in the fourfold gospel. And so the a uh, lion became associated with the Gospel of Mark that presents Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the bull was, became associated with the Gospel of Luke, which begins and ends at the temple and presents Jesus as the sacrificial one. And the bull, of course, being, or the ox, sometimes portrayed as a, as a sacrificial animal like the Lord who gives his life for the life of the world. And the eagle was applied to John, which theologically soars above all the other Gospels. But the man became associated with St. Matthew, who presents our Lord as the Son of Man. Unless we misunderstand, the title Son of Man does not emphasize Jesus' humanity. The idea of the Son of Man goes back to Psalm 8, which asks the question, What is the Son of Man that you care for him, 
you have placed him only a little bit lower than God and have crowned him with glory and honor and placed all things under his feet, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea, etc. So that's what Psalm 8 says about the Son of Man if you read in a literal translation. He's one only a little lower than God and has mastery over the whole universe. And that was understood uh, by the Jews and later by the early Christians as referring to our Lord during his earthly sojourn who accepts in his incarnation limitations that place him under the Father but is indeed the king over all creation. That is the Son of Man. And Matthew presents him strongly in this role as he was expected by the Jews, Son of Man being a title of the Messiah. And in Matthew's Gospel, Christ shines forth as this one who is king over all creation. So yeah, the obvious question is, there's four Gospels, but only three liturgical years. So what gives? Don't we like John? Well, the fact of the matter is, we get plenty of John in every liturgical year. John is heavily woven into Advent and Easter in particular, and at strategic positions elsewhere in the liturgical year as well. So the basic uh, framework, you might say, is that We have three liturgical years for what we call the three synoptic gospels. Synoptic is a Greek word that means to look with or to look in the same manner. Matthew, Mark, and John each present our Lord using the same basic chronology as the others. John has a different chronology of our Lord's ministry. So we have three liturgical years, A, B, and C, for the three synoptic gospels that have the uh, same basic biography of our Lord, and then heavy doses of John are, as it were, mixed in with all those years, especially poor Mark's year, year B. Mark is so short, uh, he's almost not long enough to make up an entire liturgical year, and so we get heavy supplements from John in year B. So, yeah, we love John, and we get John all the time. We get John in every liturgical year, but we cycle through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here's a unique verse of Matthew that is widely misunderstood and for understandable reasons. Matthew 2.23, which we read at the end of the Gospel for Holy Family Sunday in year A, reads like this, He went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now the real stumper and the head-scratcher is that you can search through the entire Old Testament and you will never find a verse that says he shall be called a Nazarene. So what on earth does Matthew mean that the prophet spoke and it's now fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene? It actually is a pun and a wordplay on a Hebrew word for branch. One of the terms for a branch or a sprout in the Hebrew language is netzer. It is, in fact, the basis of the name of the city of Netzareth. Netzareth translates into English roughly as Branchton, the town of the branch. And in this, Matthew sees great significance because one of the titles of the Messiah, according to the prophets, was branch from the stump of David. So we think, for example, of Isaiah 11, verse 1, that talks about a shoot coming forth from the stump of Jesse and a branch coming forth from the house of David. And the term used there in Isaiah 11 is netzer. This is also used elsewhere in the prophets as well. And so when Matthew says that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene, He's referring to multiple passages 
of the Israelite prophets that speak of the Messiah under this title, Branch. And Matthew's making the observation, how could we miss it? It was so clear in hindsight. The branch came from Branchton. It's so exciting for me to see the Word of the Lord Year A come into print and feel those physical copies in my hand because it's the culmination of this four set series and what has been well over a decade of labor in my career. This began many years ago, maybe in 2005, 2006, where I started a blog with some friends of mine and we agreed to comment on the Sunday readings, but my friends never commented. And so I ended up being the little red hen who picked up the slack and having to make a commentary on every Sunday of the liturgical year. And as I worked through that whole process and through the three-year cycle, three times, a total of nine years, uh, filling in all those Sundays, there were many times when I felt so burdened and I'm like, Lord, why have my friends let me down and why have I, uh, you know, have this task of coming up on a weekly basis with a commentary on these readings. But in the process, the Lord was forcing me through his word, sometimes kicking and screaming. But what blessings there were for me. I didn't know the graces that I was going to receive by working through the treasures of the church's lectionary. And now having gone through that process, what an appreciation it has given to me of how scriptural our Catholic faith is and indeed how much scripture there is in Mass. There is so much more of the Word of God in the Catholic Mass than I ever experienced in the Protestant worship that I grew up with. So I want to invite you to enter into the Word of the Lord Year A with me and indeed into all the volumes and the video production that we offer through the St. Paul Center where I and Dr. Hahn talk about these commentaries, enter into the lectionary with me because you will discover that the Holy Spirit continues to speak today through all of the Word of God, but especially when we come to receive the Word of God in the sacrament, the Word of God, body, blood, soul, and divinity, who is Jesus Christ, who speaks but then enters our body in the most blessed sacrament.